we continue our series called Death to Life. We're looking at the seven signs of John. John has written this account, this eyewitness account, to help us believe. And when you came in a couple weeks ago, we were giving out New Testament so that we can read through the Gospel of John. I hope you've been doing that with us. If not, you can pick up one today. And as you read through it, just pray, God, show me who you are, who you want me to be. Whether you've walked with God for a long time or you're not even sure about God, I know you will be amazed at how he answers that prayer. But I want us to shift into this second sign. Last week, we saw Jesus turn water into wine. In week one, we discovered who John viewed Jesus to be, the Son of God, fully man, fully, fully God, walking among us. And so we have these great little videos our teams have made that help us move from one place to the next in the story. So we're going to pick up where we left off. But before we do that, let me just ask this question. Do you have trust issues? It, it, it's, it, some of you uh, might. Uh, maybe many of us do. Uh, it's a ridiculous question, apparently. Uh, but I want to ask you, if you have trust issues with people, how does that translate into trust issues with God? And, and could it be that if you begin to trust God more fully, it might help you learn to trust people again? And know when to have healthy boundaries and know when to speak up, but also know how to open your heart again to the possibility of trusting others and trusting God. We're going to talk about that, but first, let's pick up where we left off last week. The first sign, Jesus turned water into wine. Notice what happens next. After Jesus turns water into wine, John tells us about Jesus causing a stir and confronting corruption in the Jewish temple. In a conversation with a high-ranking temple official, Nicodemus, we get the most popular verse in the Bible, John 3.16. All this time, John the Baptist is still pointing people to Jesus, saying whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. Not only does Jesus challenge your religious leaders, but he challenges social, relational, and spiritual barriers when he stops to spend time with a Samaritan woman. In the middle of all this activity, a Roman official, a perceived enemy of the Jews, comes to Jesus for help. Jesus shows the world with his second miracle that his power knows no bounds. So let's just pick up right there in the passage in John chapter 4. It says this, After the two days, he left for Galilee. Now, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they had also been there. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. Here's what's fascinating about the way John tells the story. You know, these were real places in Israel. In fact, we have a map to kind of guide us in the adventures that we see Jesus having. He was, you see up near the top where the Sea of Galilee, just west of that is Cana, where he 
and turn the water into wine. And Capernaum is way up on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. And you'll notice that from Cana all the way through Samaria, you have to travel in order to get to Jerusalem. But what we discover in these intervening passages between chapter 2 and chapter 4 is Jesus has a, a conversation in Jerusalem with a religious leader named Nicodemus. But he also has a conversation with a woman at the well, a woman who was a Samaritan. Now, Samaritans were seen as unclean. They were half Gentile and half Jewish. In fact, religious Jews would avoid Samaria. But Jesus walked right through in order to have this encounter with her. And then we see that he's back in Cana, and coming all the way from Capernaum was this royal official. Word has actually traveled about Jesus. He's been speaking with authority. There has been this miracle. And the man whose son was dying asked Jesus to come and heal his son. Perhaps he's desperate, traveling this 25-mile journey. But then he comes to Jesus, and Jesus sends him away. And yet he believed, he trusted. And on that path back, if you can imagine, your son is dying, you feel like you have no other hope but to come to this man who is Jewish. We don't know if this royal official was following the faith. Perhaps he was part of Herod's royal court. Herod was seen as a traitor by the Jewish people. But he was desperate enough that he made his way to Jesus. And when Jesus said, go and your son will live, he believed him. He trusted him. How remarkable must it have been if on that 25-mile walk back, somewhere along the way, his servants came to meet up with him and told him that your son was healed, only to discover it was at the exact moment that Jesus had sent him back. There's this beautiful picture of people that were beyond the religious leaders, catching a glimpse of a God who cares for them. Perhaps even this royal official could have been a Gentile. And we see that Jesus came to create a whole new family made up of the Jewish people and Gentiles, which basically is everyone who's not Jewish. It says this in Ephesians 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Talking about those who are from Israel and those who are foreigners to Israel being brought together under one covenant through what Jesus was to do on the cross. Now this story of a desperate father seeking out help for his son shows us a few things. First, it shows us that tradition does not equal trust. Jesus is welcomed by the Galileans, many of whom had heard the teachings and saw the table flipping when Jesus was down in Jerusalem. You see, the, some of the religious leaders were scamming people for their money. They were using religion in order to make money. And Jesus wanted nothing to do with that, flipped over the tables. I saw sometime recently uh, a meme that said something like, some of us are sitting at the very tables that Jesus came to flip. Yeah, it was not a nice meme. Very convicting, right? But they are actually open. The Galileans are open, even as some of the others were not. And so when Jesus says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will never believe, he's not talking about the desperate father. He's talking about these religious leaders that were upset that Jesus was not conforming to what they wanted, that he seemed to be extending kindness to Samaritan women, and now a royal official. In John chapter 2, verse 18, the people, the religious people were saying, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Later in verse 23 of chapter 2, it says, now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. You 
see, some saw Jesus flipping the tables as a sign of his authority. It was a fulfillment of scripture that this man must be a prophet to speak out against this common practice. And yet, oftentimes what we saw in the early days of Jesus' ministry is he would tell people not to go tell people quite yet. See, there were more things that he had to do before he was willing for everyone to know that he was the Son of God. Because once that came out, the cross was just around the corner. And so Jesus is undercover for a while, doing the miraculous, teaching with authority, and yet more and more publicly people are hearing so much so that a royal official 25 miles away comes to find him. But see, sometimes if we're not careful, we could be like the religious. We love the miracle worker, but we have issues with the Messiah. Sometimes we love what Jesus can do for us. But do we actually love him? If Jesus did nothing else for you or me, would we still follow after him? Is what he did on the cross enough for us? to follow him for the rest of our lives? Or do we have a relationship with Jesus that's more transactional? We trust him when we get what we want. Our prayer time is more giving God a list of things to do for us rather than coming to him for healing and for hope and for even guidance in how to live. And here's this man, not known for being religious, known instead for being a royal official, and yet he believes Jesus at his word. We see the word of a person who's encountered Jesus can actually change the lives of other people. That Samaritan woman had this moment with Jesus where he could see things that no one else could see. They have this conversation about what true worship is all about. And then it says in this in chapter 4, verse 42, The people who had heard from her about the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, said this. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. So the most deeply religious were the most skeptical. And yet the Samaritans and now a royal official were believing in Jesus, trusting in Jesus. That he was not just a great teacher, a prophet, but he was the savior of the world. See, oftentimes, if we're not careful, our familiarity with Jesus can actually keep us from fully experiencing his presence and his power. We begin to put God in a box. We begin to expect what he might do for us, rather than have the heart and the eyes to see what new things he might want to do in us and through us. The beautiful thing is that it was not the crowd that took Jesus at his word. It was someone who had no business being there, this royal official, which we also learn in this experience that God is not bound by distance. The royal official said, sir, come before my child dies. He's inviting Jesus to travel 25 miles. They didn't have cars, buggies. They're walking 25 miles. And Jesus says, go, your son will live. Instantaneously, 25 miles meant nothing to Jesus. It wasn't like his power could only go 25 feet. His power transcended time and space. Time was of the essence to this royal official. The journey was 25 miles by foot. His son needed to live. But see, this miracle is not just a miracle of physical distance, but also there's a miracle that's happening when it comes to the distance between our head and our heart. See, the religious people were all thinking, he shouldn't even be talking to this rabbi. This royal official is a traitor being a part of the court of Herod. And yet Jesus demonstrates that love and compassion knows no bounds. The love of God extends to those we don't want it to extend to. 
his grace and mercy pours out on each and every one of us. It doesn't matter your background, the mistakes you've made. You are loved by God. Even if you refuse to believe in him or wandered away from him, his love is still there because he is love. He created you on purpose and for a purpose. And he longs for you to know him, that he might guide you to become the person he's created you to be. You see, his grace is scandalous because it extends beyond who we think it should. This man who was far geographically in the, and in the minds of the co- crowd, far spiritually, was actually closer than they were. See, it's not about knowing all the stories. It's not about all the religious rituals. It's actually having a heart that's humble enough to say, God, I need your help. See, some of us, if we're not careful, we've walked with God long enough that we begin to think when we pray, we deserve what we're asking for. We've given up some things that used to really be a struggle, but now we've lived such a godly life that God owes us something, forgetting that even the transformation we've experienced is a gift from God. We should always have a humble heart, always aware of the good gifts that we have are from God, not because we deserve them, but because he loves us and pours them over us. It reminds me of a book called How I Became Perfectly Humble by I Am Proud, right? (laughs) The moment you think you've arrived is the moment you need to start afresh. But see, Jesus is working in a different sort of way. He's not bound by limitations. And Jesus must have exuded some sort of confidence that took distance out of the equation. I'm sure the man must have been thinking, well, how how can this be possible? Why are you sending me back alone? And yet he begins the journey. He took him at his word and departed. Hugh Ross, who's a physicist, follower of Jesus, has a great ministry called Reasons to Believe, earned his PhD from the University of Toronto. He writes this about God's extra dimensionality. He writes, I have never said or believed that God is constrained by dimensions. The Bible declares and the space-time theorems prove that God is the author and creator of space and time dimensions. Therefore, God is not subject to and in no way is constrained to the space-time dimensions he creates. Therefore, in our context of being constrained to the dimensions of length, width, height, and time, God is both extra-dimensional and trans-dimensional, meaning both imminent and transcendent. I know there's a lot of big words in there. In fact, I looked up one of them. I thought he may have misspelled it. It's the word imminent, but it's a a different word. I didn't know spelled just like that. So for Jesus to remove the distance from the equation in order to miraculously heal the son was absolutely not a big deal whatsoever. He removed speed and time and distance. The creator of the universe walking among us. Willingly confined to an actual human body. Could still heal 25 miles away. Instantaneously. See, we discover that the creator of the universe, from the beginning, giving us the freedom that we have And in that freedom, we chose to go our own way. And yet, he was willing to make a sacrifice in order to cover Adam and Eve in that moment. There's this conversation that we skipped past. I want to just bring your attention to. It's with the religious leader, Nicodemus, who meets with Jesus when he's in Jerusalem. And they have this conversation. And Jesus says these words. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful, for the one whom God has sent sent, speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limits. The Father loves the Son 
and has placed everything in his hands. If you can imagine this older, wiser, religious leader, a teacher of the scriptures, is now being told by a 30-year-old man who'd been caring for his family as a carpenter that the father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands and that his spirit means God is without limit. Jesus is talking about things of God in ways that no human being had ever spoken because he was God among us. So if Jesus is beyond our human limitation of time and distance, then we can trust his ability for the supernatural. Which leads us to the third thing that we can learn from this. You and I can trust the promises of God. One of the most powerful phrases in this story is the man took Jesus at his word and departed. I mean, do we take Jesus at his word? Do we even know his word? Are we even seeking to apply it to our life? Do we have Jesus at the center of who we are? See, here's the beautiful thing is the scriptures can actually teach us those promises that we can apply to our life. There have been several over the years that I've memorized to remind myself of what's true, even when I don't feel like it maybe. One of them is Isaiah 26. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. See, any time as a a new follower of Jesus that I found myself anxious, I would quote this verse. Tim Keller calls it preaching the gospel to yourself reminding yourself of what's true even when you don't feel like it. When I was paralyzed by anxiety, afraid, unable to move forward, not knowing what to do, what decision to make, I would remind myself that God will keep me in perfect peace because he's going to give me a steadfast mind. He's going to help me trust him. I can trust him. See, we have an illusion of power in this world, an illusion of control, and we we work hard to make it feel like we have more power and control than we do, when in reality, even the very breath that we take, the life that we have, is all a gift from God. And he's entrusted us with so much, and now we can live out of gratitude a life that honors him, that brings more and more hope to others. Or James 1.5, another beautiful promise. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Let me explain exactly what this means. It's not saying you have to have a, muster up enough faith And that if you pray with enough faith, then you get what you ask for. And if you don't get what you ask for, it's because you didn't have enough faith. That's not what this is saying at all. It means when you come to God and you ask for wisdom, you are trusting that he is the God of wisdom. That he can give you wisdom. That he is faithful to keep his promises. See, God does not promise us that we will not face hardship. In fact, Jesus promised you will experience hardship. You will experience persecution. But what he did promise is that he would be with us in the midst of the hardship, in the midst of the challenges, that we don't have to go through them alone. We trust God at his word. We don't impose on him things he did not promise. But the beautiful thing is we can see throughout the scriptures he makes many, many promises. Fourth. Your testimony is a lifesaver. Telling your story can make a real difference. I mean, we give our testimonials all the time. If I asked you right now, what's your favorite restaurant? We'd all have one. We might even get on Yelp and tell the world, we love this place. With no vested interest, right? We tell people about the movies we've seen or the TV shows we're watching. And yet when it comes to 
our relationship with God, we might be a little hesitant. When someone asks you, what did you do this weekend? We might tell them the movies and the restaurants, but we may not say, well, I had an encounter with Jesus. And I understand why. They may not be looking for that. It may not be the right time. But let me, let me give you a few authentic, organic ways for that conversation to happen. Maybe if you're talking with a coworker or a friend or a neighbor and they describe something difficult going on in their life, just ask them for more. Just listen to more of the details and then ask, hey, would you mind if I started praying for you about this? And you could just genuinely pray on your own and ask them about it the next time you see them. Or next step, maybe a dangerous step, but maybe it's something God puts on your heart. You could even say, hey, would you mind if I prayed for you right now? Again, you got to be wise, you got to think this through, but you might be amazed at how open people might be in that moment. Or another instance of, of sharing your story could happen over the course of a, a lunch. Maybe you take a, a coworker out to lunch or a neighbor, a friend, extended family, hearing about their life, but also asking this question, hey, I would love to hear your spiritual journey. I've never heard your story. You know, every time I've asked that question, no one has ever declined to tell me their story. In fact, they love to tell their stories. Have you noticed that? People love to talk about themselves. And, and let them share. And then just listen for any sort of similarities between their story and your story. And you know that any time I've listened to someone share their story, and I've asked the question, would you mind if I share my story with you? No one has ever refused. And I will share my story and usually try to connect moments in their life with similar moments in mine, and then I explain to them. How in the midst of a time of doubt, a time of uncertainty, I discovered that God was real. And I discovered his name was Jesus. And when I asked him for forgiveness, when I asked that what he did on the cross counted for me, I actually experienced peace like I'd never experienced before. I actually found a purpose that I never could ever find. And that's something I would love for you to have as well. You know, many people in that moment have been very open to, well, tell me how. What do I need to do? Others have said, you know what, that's intriguing. I, I want to look into that more. And you know what I do is I ask them to start reading the Gospel of John. It, it just if you are spiritually open, instead of closed-minded, no one wants to be closed-minded. But if you're spiritually open, just start reading the Gospel of John and praying, God, if you're real, show me who you are. You know, during the Second Great Awakening in our country, the late 1700s to the early 1800s. It was a time of deep spiritual renewal. And it was a, a time when people were just sharing what God was doing in their life, normal, everyday people. Certainly when you hear of stories in history about the Great Awakenings, you hear the names of these pastors and preachers. But it was actually the stories of people encountering God, sharing their stories that one after another, intrigued those around them. See, our world needs us to become the people God created us to be. Our broken nation needs us to experience a personal spiritual renewal, and that renewal spreads to those around us. Maybe there's some things that God has put on your heart. Maybe there's someone with whom you need to make amends. Maybe there's someone that you need to forgive even though they will never ask for forgiveness. Ernest Hemingway once said, the best way to find out if you can trust somebody is to trust them. What if we apply that to our relationship with God? What if we were to ask God to guide us and then we actually did what we read in the scriptures is supposed to be true of us? What if we reminded ourselves of the promises in the scripture applied to our life? What if we acted on that kind thought that we had in our mind that could not have been from us because we don't think things that nice. It had to have been from God. You can always tell your thoughts from God's thoughts because God's thoughts always require courage. They're always selfless and they're always consistent with his character in the scriptures. 
maybe you're here and you've yet to begin a relationship with God, you can do that. Simply do this. Just pray, God, forgive me. I need what Jesus did on the cross to count for me. Help me. Lead me. This isn't the only conversation you'll have with God. It's just the first one that opens the door to a relationship that will transform your life. Whatever your next step may be, I want to invite you to take that step, to trust Him, to live like you would trust Him. He's going to invite you to do some things you don't want to do. Forgiving others is hard. Stepping out, doing something kind is hard. Sharing your story, listening to other stories is hard. Trusting Him in things are difficult is hard. invite you to stand with, with me and the band. We're going to sing a song together, but before we do, I want to pray for us. Heavenly Father, I just ask that right now, whatever you put on our hearts, that you would give us the courage to ask you for help to pull it off. God, there's some of us here that have been so hurt by other people that we've built a wall around our heart to protect us, but in reality, it's blocking you and others. God, would you just disassemble, demolish that barrier we've placed around our heart that we would learn to trust you again. We blame you for the things that have happened to us. God, help us to forgive others who don't deserve forgiveness just as we don't. Thank you that you love us. God, would you give us the courage to listen to other stories, share our story, that we would trust you. Just as this man did 2,000 years ago, he believed you at your word. May we become people like that, God. And so as we sing this song, that God, may it be a declaration of what we want to be true in our life, what is true in our life, because you 